Welcome to Earth Science Lecture. This is Professor Diana L. Pomeroy, and this week we'll be learning about geologic time. The way we measure time in our everyday life, years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, and seconds, is significantly different than the way that scientists perceive and understand time. Recall that space and time originated in a single moment about 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang event and the ongoing expansion of our universe. Our understanding of time on this scale, on the order of millions and billions of years, is a relatively new concept. It was first realized in the 1800s and finalized through calculations of the absolute age of the Earth and our solar system in the 1960s. Recall also that the linear progression of time does not technically exist, thanks to the theory of relativity. So for the purposes of this class, I'm going to be sticking to this progressive time flow and the progression of life on Earth, but realize that time and life do not work in this way. So instead, recognize that the universe is expanding and time doesn't really flow in a linear way. It actually flows in kind of like a whirl or a spiral. In comparison to a human being's average lifespan, which is about 80 years or so, give or take, time on the order of millions and billions of years is absolutely vast. The concept that time is immense, that Earth itself is ancient, this concept is called deep time. On this slide is the entryway to the Smithsonian Museum's Deep Time Fossil Hall, which shows various forms of life in different environments over millions of years of time. Each of these organisms are then sectioned off into this whirl or spiral that you see before you. Yet how do we know what the Earth was like so long ago? And what evidence do we have of changes to Earth's environments and life over time? Sediments and sedimentary rocks are the only type of rock on our surface that preserve evidence of ancient environments and life over time, in the form of fossils specifically. That's due to how sediments develop and are deposited. So recall that sedimentary rocks develop from different types of sediment. There's three major categories. We have detrital or clastic, which form from other rocks on our surface, biochemical or organic, that form from once living things, and chemical sediments that form from evaporated water or precipitated materials from water solution. Each of these types of sediment will collect in various depositional environments, so say the bottom of the ocean, the bottom of a lake or a river, in a desert, a swamp, possibly on a beach. And so as these sediments collect and compact and cement together, they are lithified, they develop into different types of sedimentary rocks like sandstone, mudstone, and limestone. And on this slide, we've got how sandstone can form as a detrital sedimentary rock from quartz sand that develops from granite bodies that have been uplifted and eroded over millions of years. Sediments and sedimentary rocks that form from these deposits show evidence of layering. A layer of one of these types of sedimentary rocks, a shale, is called a bed, and it's typically what we call a bed of strata, strata, uh, stratum or strata plural. Um, we're referring to distinct types of sediment and sedimentary rocks. So shale is just one type of sedimentary rock that could be represented in this layer. Multiple beds stack up to form a much larger unit of rock that we call a formation. And these typically represent spans of geologic time, usually periods of geologic time. They represent millions and millions of years. On this slide, we have an image of the Grand Canyon that I took in 2012. And we've got some beautiful formations here in this canyon that span hundreds of millions of years. This entire canyon represents about 550 million years of time or more. Uh, in just this one particular area. For centuries, 
Geologists recognized that the layers of sediment that were deposited on Earth represented changes to Earth's surface, but the age of the Earth was an absolute mystery. One of the first scientists to become intrigued by the order of layers of sediment was Nicolaus Steno in the 1600s. Steno was an anatomist that was fascinated by the similarities of parts of living creatures. He would compare them and contrast them not only to other living creatures, but to various natural phenomena. He extended this concept to the rocks around him to recognize that creatures of today are a byproduct of their natural environment, and that rocks recorded changes to that environment, which in turn are reflected by the preserved remains of living things in the rocks. He developed what are now referred to as Steno's principles or Steno's laws to describe changes to sediment over time. These principles were later added to and expanded on in the 1800s by the geologists James Hutton and Charles Lyell. Now their work was influential not only in uh, the being relative dating principles in geology, but also in the theory of evolution, as posited by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace in the 1800s. Altogether, the geologic principles that we're going to be learning about next are what are known as relative dating principles. Relative means a comparison of materials based on a sequence or an order of deposition without exact units of time being compared or applied. So in this case, we're gonna be comparing the order of formations of sediment or strata in an outcrop, generating a sequence of events and determining what happened to a particular region over time. There's six relative dating principles, superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity, igneous intrusions, cross-cutting relationships, and unconformities. The first three are considered Steno's principles or laws. The latter three were de developed by Hutton and Lyell later on in time. So in the 1800s, those last three were developed. The law of superposition states that the oldest layers of sediment are at the bottom of a sequence and the youngest are at the top. On this illustration I made, several beds of sediment and rock have been formed. The correct sequence of this outcrop from oldest layer to youngest layer is read from the bottom of the outcrop to the top. Shale, siltstone, fine sandstone, coarse sandstone, and conglomerate. The next slide shows the same phenomenon in an actual canyon in Utah. So superposition is the most important principle. If you understand this principle of superposition, you will understand all of the other principles that will follow. So again, oldest layers of sediment were deposited first, youngest deposited last. That's the law of superposition. So here we've got part of a canyon in Utah. Again, it's the Goosenecks uh, Park, and we've got a river system flowing here, and we've got our layers of sediment deposited, showing very clearly the law of superposition. The law of original horizontality states that layers of sediment were deposited laterally, so they were once deposited on a flat surface. Over time, those layers can be tilted due to tectonic forces, so they can be uplifted and then tilted and folded. Despite this, the order of those layers is the same. On this illustration that I made, you can see that this outcrop from the first example has been sheared off and it's been tilted, but the order of deposition, the order of the layering sequence stays the same, such that the shale is still the oldest layer in the sequence and the conglomerate is still the youngest. The next slide shows a similar phenomenon, but we observe it in nature uh, in the Rainbow Basin in California. And it's specifically part of a fold called a syncline. So despite that process of a syncline forming, the order of deposition remains the same. So here we've got our syncline in the beautiful Rainbow Basin in California. That shows the law of original horizontality. The next law is the law of lateral continuity. The law of lateral continuity states that layers of sediment are deposited in a continuous way. 
So in other words, when layers are deposited, whether it's shale or silt or sand, those layers are deposited continuously. They could potentially be deposited forever on a flat surface. It's just continuous, one single deposit, continuous in one area. Over time, as those sediments solidify into sedimentary rocks and then they're uplifted, erosion can take place. And despite this process of erosion, like let's say in a canyon, it's safe to assume that a layer of sediment on one side of the canyon in one position is the same as a layer on the opposite side. So that's what we see here in this illustration of a canyon that I made. You can see that the layers of sandstone, for example, are the same type on opposite sides. So it's exactly the same on opposite sides. That's the law of lateral continuity. Another example of this is through an actual canyon. That's from Utah. So here's the actual canyon. And we've got, again, law of lateral continuity operating here, showing that you can look at, say, one of these sediment layers, one of these sandstone layers on one side of the canyon, and it's going to be the exact same layer on the opposite side. It's just been eroded away by this river flowing through the landscape. That's the law of lateral continuity. Now again, the next three laws I'm going to introduce to you were developed by these individuals here pictured on this slide. On the left, we've got James Hutton, who was a Scottish geologist. And on the right, we've got Charles Lyell, uh, English geologist. And so both these geologists uh, from the UK, they lived during the 1800s. Charles Lyell actually wrote a book about these principles uh, called Principles of Geology. And we still use this text today uh, when we're referencing relative dating laws. So the next relative dating law is the law of igneous intrusions. The law of igneous intrusion states that the youngest layer in a sequence of sediment with an igneous intrusion is the igneous intrusion that overlaps all of their material behind it. So in this example, there's a photograph of a three-dimensional cross-section of a volcano model. So we've got a volcano model, and it's a cross-section. A cross-section is like, think of the Earth like a layer cake. If you were to take out a chunk of the Earth and slice it and look at the layers within, that's essentially what we're doing with the cross-section. So here we've got a volcano in cross-section. We've got layers of sediment here. We've got, at the bottom, we've got some white limestone, then we've got some blue shale above that, orange conglomerate above that, and we've got yellow sandstone above that. All of these layers are then intruded on by a magma chamber, a magma pipe that pushes through to the surface and forms this volcano. So essentially this volcano had to have been developed at a later time, it's geologically younger than the sediments that it's intruding through. Now on the next slide, I've got an actual image of uh, basalt intrusion between layers of rhyolite. So on this image, we've got this dark gray layer of rock that's actually basalt. It's a basalt flow that intruded and moved through the surrounding rhyolite. So it's got to be younger in the sequence, at least according to the law of igneous intrusions. The next law in the relative dating laws is the law of cross-cutting relationships. The law of cross-cutting relationships states that the youngest layer in a sequence is the layer that cuts diagonally across the layers behind it. So in this example, there's a photo again of a three-dimensional cross-section model and it's got a series of normal and reverse faults in sediments. So these faults, which are represented here by diagonal lines, are moving the layers of sediment. So we've got, again, in this particular sequence, we've got some green shale, white limestone, blue siltstone, orange conglomerate, and then yellow sandstone at the top. And each one of these is being moved either up or down with respect to the faults. So this motion indicates that these faults had to have formed at a later point in time. From a geologic perspective, the faults are younger than the sediments themselves. 
That's the law of cross-cutting relationships. On the next slide, it shows a person standing next to a fault line and a road cut outcrop of sediment in California. Road cuts are areas where essentially to make room or to make a new part of the road, uh, you blow up part of a hillside. And in doing so, uh, you expose sediment layers. So actually road cuts are ex excellent areas uh, for geologists and paleontologists to work. But here's an individual standing beside this fault in California in this road cut. And you can clearly see the layers that have been displaced or moved by the fault. So this fault had to be younger than the layers that it's displacing, cross-cutting relationships. Unconformities is the last law of relative dating laws. Unconformities are gaps in the geologic record due to a phenomenon that we call erosion. Erosion means that we're destroying sediment layers, thus we're losing time. There's three different types of unconformities. These are disconformities, angular unconformities, and nonconformities. A disconformity occurs when layers of sediment are deposited, lithify, and are uplifted. The uppermost layer in a disconformity happens, it becomes eroded, okay? So the uppermost layer of the sediment becomes eroded, New sediments are then in place on top, and usually this is due to rising sea level. So in this example from textbook, we've got this uppermost layer that gets eroded, and new sediment has been in place on top, and this new sediment in this instance is gonna be some limestone that's in place on top of that layer of erosion. And so this point right here that's outlined in bold with the red arrows, that is representing our disconformity. It's a point between the older layers beneath it and the younger layers on top that has missing sections. An angular unconformity occurs when layers of sediment are again deposited, lithophane or uplifted, but in this case, after the uplift event or possibly during the uplift event, layers of sediment then become tilted because they're part of a fold. So folds happen usually at great depth and pressure in the crust, and usually this is due to what we call an orogeny event or a mountain building event. So due to tectonic forces like compression, those sections of rock are being squished together and folded up, and as they're getting folded up, that uppermost portion of, say, the mountain or hillside, over time, it will become eroded. And so as it becomes eroded, the upper surface gets destroyed, Sea level rises, floods the landscape, more sediment gets deposited on top of that line of erosion. So with an angular unconformity, what's happening is those layers of sediment that were initially deposited have been folded. They're at an angle with respect to the layers above the line of erosion. So the layers below the line of erosion and an angular unconformity are at an angle with respect to the layers above that line of erosion. A nonconformity occurs when, again, layers of sediment are deposited, they lithify, and then are uplifted. But in this situation, what happens to the nonconformity is a pool of magma will rise to the surface, and in this process, it will completely destroy whatever sediments were already deposited. New sediment then gets emplaced on top, say again, because of sea level rise. Those sediments then get emplaced on top of that erosion and that represents that boundary point of igneous or even metamorphic rock. So that pool of magma solidifies into an igneous rock and sediment gets emplaced on top of that igneous rock layer. So again, those are our unconformities. These represent gaps in the geologic time record. So that eroded layer is a missing section of time. In a way, it's like taking pages from a book and ripping them out. I think that actually comes from a Robin Williams movie. I forget which one it is. That the, the book, the pages in the book get ripped out. So you know what happens in the beginning of the story, and you know what happens at the end, but you're not sure what happens in the middle. And that's essentially very much like what happens with the nonconformity. There's sections of the story that are missing. In California, we have several. So in California, we have several examples of unconformities, and we'll come back to those examples later on. 
So while the sequence of deposition can be determined by examining sediments by themselves, fossils, the evidence of ancient life that's preserved in sediment, are critical in determining exactly when particular events to develop that landscape took place. The first geologist to develop a geologic map of England with the rock types and fossil material mapped and explained was William Smith in 1815. He developed what's now referred to as the principle of fossil succession. So with the principle of fossil succession, what it states is something like this. If we were to travel back in time, certain creatures would be present. They would evolve and become extinct. And in this way, they would reveal a succession or supposed progression of life on Earth. So for example, uh, a mere few thousand years ago, the Ice Age creatures like saber-toothed cats existed in Southern California. If we were to travel to several million years prior, the environment would be much more tropical and humid, and different creatures like horses, pigs, wolf, and deer relatives, all of those creatures would dominate the land and be totally different type of landscape. And if we were to travel even farther back in time to possibly maybe 70 million years ago or so, we might be standing in a shallow sea, watching volcanoes erupting in the distance, and encountering maybe a hadris or dinosaur or two. So in this way, each creature's fossil represents a waypoint in time, a moment in this supposed progression or succession of life. This translates to a cliffside or an outcrop in such a way where, where we keep superposition in mind, creatures like dinosaurs should be found towards the bottom or even the middle of an outcrop or a cliff, and creatures like saber-toothed cats should be encountered at the top. Now, this isn't always the case in nature. There's a lot of areas where certain formations will outcrop in some areas more so than others. And again, considering that we've got unconformities happening, um, you may not always have certain fossils and certain times represented. But for the most part, this tends to hold true, where we see the succession of the supposed progression of more quote unquote advanced life the farther up that we go um, to the surface, whereas we find older life at greater depths or at a lower point in that outcrop. So on this example, I've got an outcrop of sediments. And by the way, if you isolate an outcrop of sediments, and you can actually draw them into what we call a stratigraphic column. So strata, again, we're talking layers of sediment. So anytime we've got layering going on, we've got strata. Strata, plural for stratum. So stratum is single layer. And so here we've got multiple layers, multiple strata that have been deposited in this particular outcrop. And again, it's just like the ones I showed you before. We have shale, siltstone, limestone, sandstone, and conglomerate in these layers. And Following the law of superposition, I know that the oldest layer is going to be shale and the youngest layer is going to be conglomerate. Let's say in this limestone layer, we pull out some fossils. So say part of this limestone layer has been eroded. So the, all the previous layers on top have been eroded away, exposing some of the limestone in some areas. You can excavate the limestone and find fossils. And in this case, let's say you're lucky and you happen across a fossil of an ancient bird that we call Archaeopteryx, which is shown here. Fossils, remember, the remains of organisms that are preserved in sediment. There's multiple types of fossilization on this image. We've got that I, this illustration that I've drawn. We have a body fossil and we have impressions of feathers um, surrounding that fossil. Now, particular fossils that are preserved, uh, ones that are found in abundance globally, that are unique to a particular area, they're unique in their appearance, they're a one-time thing. These are what we call index fossils. Now, index fossils are often used to represent particular formations from certain locations, and these in turn are used to represent distinct periods or eras of geologic time. And so, essentially, what the principle of fossil succession states is that the placement of fossils in sedimentary rock layers 
help to determine which rocks are going to be older in the sequence and which rocks are going to be younger in the sequence. And for hundreds of years, geologists have used the relative dating laws by Steno, by Hutton and Lyell, and by Smith's fossil succession to determine the sequence of events in a particular region. So what happened to make a particular region the way it was a very long time ago? So there was this idea, this concept that the earth was indeed old and fossil succession kind of hinted at this phenomenon, but we didn't know exactly how old the earth was until around the 1950s and 1960s when we began to experiment with the atom and with atomic energy. Uh, so exactly how old the Earth was, we had no idea. We didn't know until the 1960s. It was estimated based on depositional rates that the Earth was somewhere between maybe a couple million years old to maybe 15 billion years old. We had no idea. We didn't know how old the Earth was. Here's the thing. Sediment deposition on its own and even the placement of fossils in those sediments is not necessarily the best way to determine exact age because remember you can have sudden flood events, you can have sudden times when these sediments are formed and deposited so it's not an exact, you can't compare exact values, you can't say oh yes we know this fossil definitely came from this time frame without further evidence in the form of the atoms that are preserved in some of those rocks and fossils. And so investigation into this really began in the 1950s and 1960s, actually right here in Pasadena, California, uh, with the work of someone named Claire or Pat Patterson. Now, uh, Claire Patterson is an interesting person. Uh, if you want to read more about him, you can always Google. Uh, but he was part of, I think, the Manhattan Project in the 1950s and 1960s. If you're not sure what that is, uh, Google, uh, but it's eh, eh. anyway. So during this time, we were looking at atomic theory and looking at, unfortunately, not only atoms as part of weapons, uh, but also looking at atoms in terms of an energy source. Nuclear energy was something that in the 1950s and 1960s, around the Cold War time frame, uh, that we really began to invest in. And Claire Patterson's work was kind of a byproduct of this situation. So what's interesting is that Claire Patterson got pulled into this project uh, by someone named Harrison Brown. He pulled him in and said, hey, you know, I want you to evaluate these crystals that we've found on the surface of meteorites. And these crystals are called zircon crystals. Zircon crystals are, you know, like think of cubic zirconia, right? Um, zircon crystals can contain minor, small amounts of particular elements that are essential for determining what's known as the half-life uh, or the time frame in which particular rocks and fossils existed. So scientists have been uh, messing around with the atomic structure and looking at the rate of radioactive decay of elements starting during this time, the 1950s and 1960s. So Claire Patterson's job was to examine the lead content of zircon crystals, and he and his colleague George Tilton did this. George Tilton was looking at uranium content and uh, Patterson was looking at lead content. And they were examining these contents using what's known as a mass spectrometer. In the mineral lecture, I told you, I think briefly about a mass spectrometer, what it is. It's a device that uses lasers and magnets and it counts and separates atoms that are present in a substance. Basically, it blasts the substance into particles and to atoms and it will separate and sort those atoms according to their mass. When it comes to absolute age, absolute is exact units, we're actually looking at these ratios of atoms that are present in particular mineral crystals. So with Patterson's work, he was looking at the atomic content of zircon crystals that have been found on the surface of meteorites. Now, why meteorites? Well, recall from previous lectures that the solar system, the sun's formation, all the planets, meteorites, and all that, all of that formed approximately 4.6 billion years ago. Now, that data wasn't known prior to this study. So how we know this is by examining 
the uranium and lead concentrations that are present in these crystals. Uranium is an unstable or radioactive atom. So atoms have stability and instability inherent in their structure. This is because of the fact that the nucleus of an atom can have varying numbers of neutrons within it. Recall that the nucleus of the atom has protons and neutrons in it. You add the number of protons and neutrons together, you get the mass of the atom. Some atoms in nature, which are known as isotopes, have varying amounts of neutrons. So what you see on the periodic table of elements is actually an average. It's an average of the masses of particular elements. When we're looking at isotopes, we're looking at variability in that average. We're looking at differences in the amounts of neutrons in the nuclei of certain atoms. So some atoms that have a heavier mass, they usually will have more neutrons than protons in their structure. And what this means is, is that these atoms will break down in a process known as radioactive decay. They will break down multiple times to form eventually a more stable nuclear structure and develop into an entirely different atom, what we call a stable daughter product. In the case of uranium, it will break down, I think, about 40-ish times, and I'm not going to expect you to know all the breakdowns in the reaction, but uranium will break down about 40 times to develop into lead. Depending on the type of uranium, the mass of the original uranium atom that radioactively decayed into lead, you get differences in the uh, masses of the lead byproduct. And that's what we can see here on this diagram from Patterson's work. So uranium is radioactive. It will break down numerous times, eventually developing into the stable daughter product, the stable atom of lead. Now this breakdown actually can be measured in terms of time. And in fact, this breakdown in terms of time is exact. And this is what we use to determine the absolute age, not only of our planet, but of pretty much everything on its surface. So on these images from earthside.org and nature.com, uh, we've got some diagrams here showing the parent isotope, the parent radioactive isotope that will break down into the stable daughter product, and the amount of time it takes for half of that original amount of parent isotope to break down, which is known as the half-life. So the half-life, which is not just a video game, okay, half-life actually refers to the amount of time it takes for half of the original amount of the parent isotope to break down into a stable daughter product. And so every radioactive element has a distinct half-life. It has a set amount of time that it will break down. And for uranium-238 breaking down into lead-206, its half-life is approximately 4.5 billion years of time. That is the age of our planet. We have multiple half-lives here and depending on the and multiple parent-daughter ratios, so depending on what you're measuring, depending on the age of a fossil that you want to figure out the age of, so let's say that you for example wanted to figure out how old that Archaeopteryx was in the previous example you're more likely to use something like potassium to argon ratio than, or rubidium to strontium, although potassium argon will probably be more accurate. You probably wanna use that rather than carbon. So a lot of times there's a confusion uh, between carbon dating and absolute age dating. Carbon dating is a specific type of absolute age dating. So they're still looking at the breakdown of carbon over time into its stable daughter product, in this case, carbon 13, our carbon-14 will break down into nitrogen. So carbon-14 specifically, more often than not, will break down into nitrogen. So there's certain ratios of these radioactive elements present in a substance, and that half-life, that breakdown time, is only a few thousand years. So if someone's saying, oh yeah, you know, we, we dated this dinosaur using carbon-14, 
uh, dating methods, that's incorrect. Uh, carbon dating, the maximum amount of time that we're looking at is probably around 25 to 50,000 years, and that's it. We're not looking at millions of years of time with carbon dating. So we're only referencing, really with carbon dating, we're looking at maybe something from the last ice age, more like a saber-toothed cat or a mastodon versus a dinosaur. All right, so there's different ratios, there's different elements you can use to determine the absolute age or the exact age of not only a fossil organism, but also of rocks themselves. And in fact, a lot of absolute age dating comes from igneous rock layers. It comes from layers of basalt or layers of volcanic ash that provide these exact ratios, these values that we need to determine the exact ages or boundary points of geologic time. So this gives us the numbers. This gives us the time, the numbers of these times. When we combine together relative ages, so formations with the fossils, with this absolute age, you take all of this information together, what results is what we call the geologic time scale. So relative dating principles and absolute age dating together are what generated our geologic time scale. Now the geologic time scale did exist um, before absolute age. Keep that in mind. It was originally developed based on the presence of formations and fossils, but over time, of course, over time, we've added uh, these exact units, these absolute ages, to define distinct boundary points between each of these time frames. So in geology, we have four main ways that we look at time, and there's four major spans of time. In geology, we divide time into four basic units. These are eons, eras, periods, and epochs. Eons, eras, periods, and epochs. Eons are the largest unit of geologic time. For the purposes of this class, there's only one eon of time that we have to worry about, and that's what I've drawn here on this illustration, and that's what we call the Phanerozoic, the Phanerozoic eon of time. It represents about 550 million years, approximately, of time, at least, for, again, for the purposes of this class. So we're not going to go into the Precambrian, uh, we're not going to push back into like the Hadean or the Archean, we're not going to worry about that for this class. If you're interested in knowing more, I'll be posting some more information about that, about uh, paleontology and time and historical geology stuff on another set, another playlist uh, on YouTube. So if you're interested in that stuff, uh, there's going to be a whole other section devoted to that later on. So keep an eye out for that. So Eon is the largest span of time, again, hundreds of millions of years. So we're talking you know, on the order of about 500 million years or so um, per eon, the biggest chunk of time. The next division of time is what we call an era. Now, this is the geologic time scale. This is the latest version of the geologic time scale published by the Geological Society of America. And so we've got three eras of time here within that Phanerozoic eon. And these are as follows, in order from oldest to youngest. We have Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic. There are three eras of geologic time. These are Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. So the Paleozoic era, uh, and by the way, each one of these eras lasts about, oh, 250 million years or so, 200 to 250 million years of time. So yeah, that's an era, okay? So it's a smaller subdivision of an eon. So kind of think of it, I like to think of it as like a series of nesting dolls. The largest one, okay, that's your eon. Within that, you have an era. Now, eras are also further subdivided into points that we call periods. Now, of course, this diagram, there's a lot of periods of time and even more, there's epics um, and ages. For the purposes of this class, I'm just gonna focus on a few periods within each era. Now, periods are smaller units of time within an era, so these usually last about 50 million years. Most formations represent either periods or their smaller division epochs of time. So in California, we actually have quite a few formations that actually span only epochs of time, 
because most of our sediments here are geologically young. So there's lots of different periods, as you can see on this diagram, there's lots of different epochs and ages. I'm just going to share with you a few of the periods from each era that I want you to know, including their absolute ages. So that's what I'm going to go over with you next. In the Paleozoic era, we have two periods that I want you to know. The first, which is the Cambrian at the bottom of this diagram. By the way, we read this diagram like we do any layer of strata. So the bottom is older and the top is younger. This bottom layer is the Cambrian period. It lasted from approximately 540 to 480 million years ago. That was the beginning of the Paleozoic era. The last period in the Paleozoic era is known as the Permian. The Permian period lasted between 300 approximately and 250 approximately million years ago. Now I'm saying approximately because these values change. These values change over time. There are scientists and stratigraphers that study uh, the exact ranges of each of these boundary points. So there is a major boundary point between the Permian and the Triassic periods between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras of time. And so this boundary point is represented, unfortunately, by a mass extinction event. In fact, that's usually what separates eras of time are these extinction events. In some cases, periods of time are separated by extinction events. But again, if you want to know more about that, there's a whole other class for that. So the Paleozoic era, there's two periods, Cambrian, Permian. Mesozoic era, the middle era of time. There are three periods that you'll need to know in order. Again, looking at the bottom of the diagram, moving up to the top, we have the Triassic, which lasted from 250 to 200 million years ago, approximately. The Jurassic, which lasted between 200 and 145 million years ago. And then we have the Cretaceous period, which lasted between 145 and 66 million years ago. At the end of the Cretaceous period, we had what's generally referred to as the dinosaur extinction event. So at that point, again, mass extinction, lots of stuff died. Now we're moving forward into the last era of time, which is the era of time that we're living in right now. This is the Cenozoic era. The Cenozoic era is divided into two periods. Now, the tertiary and quaternary, these are actually very old terms for periods. They've been around for hundreds of years because uh, geologic time used to be di divided into four sections. So primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Uh, and so tertiary and quaternary have stuck around for a long time. Tertiary has recently been divided further into two periods called the Paleogene and the Neogene. Now, for the purposes of this class, I'm going to lump them together. And somewhere a stratigrapher is wincing. I'm lumping them together into the tertiary, okay, for the purposes of this class to keep it simple. The tertiary period lasted between 66 and about 2.5 to 3 million years ago. So 66 million years ago to 2.5 to 3 million years ago. That's when the tertiary period lasted. Finally, we are in the quaternary. So that's the period of time that we are in right now is the quaternary. And the quaternary lasted from about two and a half million years ago to the present. So again, those are our periods of time within each of those eras. So eras are the longer span. We're talking about 200 million years or so. Periods are the shorter span. We're talking maybe 50 million years or so or less, depending on you know, which area you're in. And then finally, the shortest span of time that we have in the geologic time scale are epochs. Now, on this diagram, these epochs are further subdivided into ages. Again, you don't have to worry about that for this class. Epochs are the smallest unit of time. And the only two epochs that you need to know are the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Both of these epochs occur within the Quaternary period. And that total span of time between the Pleistocene and Holocene represents essentially what we call the last glacial maximum. That's the time frame when glaciers spanned uh, the largest that they did since Snow Law Earth. Uh, huge swaths of, of the world were covered in glaciers at that time. And at the end of the last glacial maximum, at the end of the last ice age, starting around 50,000 years ago, uh, all of those glaciers retreated or melted and developed the world uh, as we know it today. Uh, so really, that's the time frame. So we are in 
which era? We're in the Cenozoic era, we're in the Quaternary period, and we are in the Holocene epoch. Now, my thesis advisor is pushing for what's known as the Anthropocene. Uh, the Anthropocene epoch of time. This is controversial. I'm not going to get into it much now, but I just want to point out to you that our activities in terms of climate could potentially mean that we are officially a part of the geologic record. Uh, is that going to be valid? There's a lot of argument for and against it. So for right now, I'm just going to say the Pleistocene and the Holocene are the names of the epochs of time within the Quaternary period in the Cenozoic era that you have to really worry about. So the last few slides on this PowerPoint are going to show some examples of life from each era of time. And all of these images come from the Raymond M. Alf Museum in Claremont in California. Uh, so please note that this is a very, very, very brief overview of the evolution of life on Earth. And it's best understood in a course all by itself. Uh, this is just a brief overview to help you recall the order of the geologic time sequence and the geologic time scale. So with this, I'm just going to show you each of the eras and some representative forms of life. I'm going to briefly go over how life has evolved in each era and the nicknames for each era based on those life forms. The first era of time, remember, the oldest era is what we call the Paleozoic era. The Paleozoic era, the ancient time, is often referred to as the age of fishes. Towards the beginning of this era, we had a lot of life in the ocean. Life diversified in the ocean, life originated in the ocean with microorganisms. And for billions of years, our surface was covered in microorganisms like bacteria uh, and things that just floated and lived in the deep sea in the ocean. Uh, we didn't really have a whole lot of life forming on land. In fact, land itself didn't really have a whole lot of life on its surface till the end of the Paleozoic. So a lot of life really diversified, originated in the ocean. A lot of those fossils from this time frame come from the ocean, especially towards the beginning of the Paleozoic. In California, we have quite a few specimens from the Paleozoic, things like trilobites, for example, um, those kinds of creatures that lived during this time. Towards the end of the Paleozoic is when I suppose life gets more interesting, if that's your kind of thing, if you're biased towards land uh, living creatures like me. So towards the end is when we get various species of plants, insects, fish, reptiles, mammal-like reptiles, amphibians begin to take over um, landscape, it began to evolve and move towards land. But then at the end of the Paleozoic, we had a mass extinction event. Now this mass extinction event was caused supposedly from volcanic eruptions uh, and those volcanic eruptions wiped out about 90% of all known life on Earth, which was bad. Only about 10% of life as we know it made it um, past this boundary point between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. And that is essentially the end of the Paleozoic. So at the end of the Paleozoic, about 90% of all known life, all of these creatures that you see on this screen are no longer with us. They're gone. They're extinct. And then we move on to the Mesozoic. So the Mesozoic era is known as the Age of Reptiles or the Age of Dinosaurs. I like to call it Age of Dinosaurs. Uh, but anyway, towards the beginning of this era, we had reptiles, amphibians, some of the mammal-like reptiles, but more so reptiles and amphibians began to dominate the niches that were left behind uh, from the Permian mass extinction. They began to dominate not only the land, but also the ocean. So we had all kinds of radiation of life during this time non-avian dinosaurs, birds, species of seed-bearing and flowering plants, coral reef systems, marine and flying that were more modernized, I suppose. We would recognize the coral reefs uh, from this time, you know, towards the end of the Cretaceous, really. Uh, marine and flying reptiles, like we have on the slide, and mammals began to evolve at this time as well. So on this slide, we've got a dinosaur, we've got Coelophysis, we've got Rampharynchus, which is a type of pterosaur or flying reptile, and we've got a plesiosaur, which is a marine or swimming reptile. Now, by the way, uh, Rampharynchus and plesiosaurs, these are not dinosaurs, but they're reptiles. 
and I'll get into why that is in another lecture. So I'm going to post that on the uh, paleontology uh, list. So unfortunately, as we know, towards the end of the era, another extinction event happened. So 66 million years ago, asteroid impact wiped out a vast majority of life, maybe 70% or so, including in ocean and land. Uh, Non-avian dinosaurs died. Uh, Marine reptiles died, flying reptiles died. All of these creatures you see on the screen went extinct, with the exception of some species of mammals, birds, and what we call the modern lines, modern lineages of life on Earth today. Uh, that's all that was left over uh, at the end of the Mesozoic. Then we move on to the last era of time, which again is the era of time that we're living in right now. Uh, that's the age of mammals. So the Cenozoic is the age of mammals from about 66 million years ago to the present day. Towards the beginning of this time frame, mammals essentially began to dominate those niches that were left behind by non-avian dinosaurs and other creatures. And then modern birds, modern mammals, all the modern creatures that we tend to think of, they began to diversify and evolve during this time as well. Now what's interesting is that on land, we started to develop these huge Mammals, uh, what we call megafauna, creatures including saber-toothed cats, uh, dire wolves, mastodons, all those creatures began to proliferate and thrive on the landscape uh, during the last Ice Age event. And when the Ice Age ended, all of those creatures went extinct. And what's interesting is we had various waves of mammals, you know, moving in and out of different uh, continents and things during this time as well. So. The landscape, remember, is changing during all these uh, points as well. That's what leads to the evolution of these different life forms, including ourselves. So modern people, uh, we really evolved in terms of Homo sapiens, our species. We really evolved during the last 50,000 years in terms of modern uh, civilization, modern uh, form, the way that we look now. Okay, that's around 50,000 years. 10,000 years ago is when human civilizations really began to thrive and change. And right now, we are still thriving on the surface of this world. We're currently going to be shaping our future. And as much as the Earth has shaped our past and our evolution. So with that, I hope that you enjoyed this lecture on geologic time. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.